All right, we'll get started back here. Uh, this time we're going to go to the Fisheries Management Committee. I'm going to ask Chairman Jim Bledsoe to, to proceed. Thank you, Chairman McMillan. I am Jim Bledsoe. I'm chair of the Fisheries Committee. At this time, I would uh, like to recognize Bobby Wilson, Chief of the Fisheries Division, to speak about Proclamation 13-12, Commercial Fishing Pro Proclamation. Thank you, Commissioner Bledsoe. Commissioners, last month at the uh, commission meeting in Knoxville, we gave a preview of, of the changes that we were recommending for commercial and sport fish. And at the request of the uh, Commercial Fishing Advisory Committee, uh, they asked us if we could consider and vote on some of these regulations a little bit earlier in the year. And uh, typically we would, we would vote on them, both of them in October, but we would bring this up for discussion and vote today. Our commercial fishing coordinator, Eric Gaines, uh, gave the presentation last month. And um, in the Beach River section of Kentucky Lake, it's never, it's been fished, but it's never been listed or described in a proclamation as being open. So we wanted to do that. And when we first proposed uh, the area we, where the red dot is, the Highway 69 bridge was a good, good geographic solid boundary where we where fishermen could recognize so that from that red dot and upstream would be uh, off limits to commercial fishing and from that red dot downstream to Kentucky Lake would be open to commercial fishing except uh, it would only be for uh, I believe slap baskets and trot lines and turtle traps and at that at that meeting uh, Ricky Scott who is the on the commercial fishing advisory committee asked if we would consider allowing gill nets and travel nets in there because they have traditionally fished for uh, with that gear for, for paddlefish. And so I asked Region 1 to, to go check that out and give us their feedback since Beach River is in Region 1. And uh, their first inclination was to, to, if they were going to allow it, they would maybe allow it a little bit further uh, downstream, excuse me, yeah, downstream at approximately mile marker 8 or 8.5 where it narrows down into a, a river area. And so uh, upon further investigation, they, they came up with, a, they found some, a, an interesting discovery. And that's that uh, with this map, turns out that a lot of that property back in the backwater area that, that is open water is actually private land. For whatever reason, back in the days when TVA bought a lot of the uh, high water mark area and, and uh, flood area, flooded area, they did not buy that area back in that open water area of, of the Beach River. And so, um, of course, when commercial fishermen set their gear, they, they sometimes they have to tie their gear off to a bank, or it, at the very least, they uh, either anchor down or their weights hit the bottom of the water, and at that point, it's private land. So uh, the recommendation then is to avoid all the legal issues involved with uh, the private land issue, which would be to only allow the commercial fishing in the area that is still public waters. And this, you might not be able to see it, but the, the uh, well, I know you can see it. The darker blue area, uh, as you can see, is open water. That's actually uh, water that's on land owned by TBA. And so our recommendation then is to uh, only open the area that's uh, where this red dot is, River Mile, approximate real River Mile 3, which is just outside of the Lost Creek Marina, um, to commercial fishing from there to the mouth. But anything above that would be close to commercial fishing. I'm going on to the next uh, proposal. There are no questions. And so, in other words, this is uh, what it would look like in the proclamation. Is is basically um, upstream to mile marker, Beach River marker, <coughs> mile marker 3.0, and then from that point upstream is closed to year-round all commercial fishing gear. Back in um, January of this year, the Commercial Fishing Advisory Committee asked or submitted a list of uh, requests to the commission for them to consider and one of those was to be able to get into the creeks and embayments on Kentucky Lake or Kentucky Reservoir during the months of April and May. Right currently they are um, basically they can only use uh, slap baskets and, and trot lines in those areas in April and May um, from well they can use those 
for the entire time, but they can't use any other kind of gear except at night. And they wanted a few more hours where they could be able to fish where they wouldn't be so uh, restricted. So we did. We, we made that change back in uh, February, I believe, or maybe March, that increased it a little bit. Not a whole lot, but we allow them to, to uh, fish until 5 o'clock in the morning and basically one hour after daylight till 5. And it was, uh, I believe it was from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. It was closed. I mean, it was only open. But they can, they can fish with uh, slap baskets and trot lines. And we, through some communication with some of the commercial turtle fishermen, they in years past have wondered why they couldn't fish back there too. So we, we decided to include the turtle traps in there too with the slap baskets. And, and just, just to kind of refresh your memory, the reasons that we have this regulation, uh, and on, it's only on Kentucky Lake and the creeks and abatements um, in April and May is because of the crappie fishermen and the, uh, the bass fishing that goes on during those months and the conflicts that might arise between some of the commercial fishermen who have, who may have gill nets or something like that in there and it was to reduce those conflicts. At Real, Real Foot Wildlife Management Area uh, is the only place in the state where they can catch all sizes and species of turtles except the box turtles and those covered in item A. And item A basically says uh, those that species that determined by the commission to be either endangered, threatened, or in need of management. So we wanted to specify what those species were. And um, <coughs> so we decided to list the 14 species. And these are the common names of the 14 species of turtles that, that we would allow for harvest at real foot. Um, of course, the rest of the state, as far as commercial fishing goes, they're only allowed to catch the common snapping turtle and they have to be 12 inches long. Real foot lake is the only place in the state where they can catch the other species of turtles that are not endangered or in need of management or threatened. Statewide turtle season. Um, basically, the turtle season is March 1 to October 31st. As you know, turtles hibernate pretty much in the colder months. Uh, a requirement by all commercial fishermen and those that fish for turtles is that they have to submit a monthly report April every month on their harvest, whether they catch anything or go fishing or not, they still have to submit a report. And by having a season on there, this would uh, eliminate the months of November through February for them having to submit a report, and which they're not fishing for them anyway. And again, those are mostly snapping turtles. I put a lot of the verbiage in here to kind of show you where the changes would be, but this is a, a relatively uh, a simple one too. The last line it says, uh, within 100 yards of the mouth of any stream or river or inlet at any time. Uh, inlet is not described in our statute or rule or proclamation. It's very subjective. And so our recommendation is to remove the word inlet out of, the, uh, out of this particular provision. Uh, commercial fishing gear hoop nets. This is a hoop net, it's a picture of one. I've actually brought a, uh, Tim Broadbent was kind enough to bring up a miniature version of a hoop net. This is just for demonstration purposes. It would never be used to catch anything, but I want to pass this around. This is so you can kind of get an idea of what a hoop net looks like three-dimensionally. But the, um, the current regulation for, for hoop nets is that they have, the mesh size is, is uh, one inch or smaller or three inches or larger on the square. And uh, the same request that was submitted back in January by the Commercial Fishing Advisory Committee asked that we, uh, that I think the exact words were they needed a, ch a uh, change in the size of the hoop nets. And so um, in dealing with them and talking and discussing with them, um, they asked for something better than what it is and so we're we recommended uh, one inch or larger on the square. Uh, the, the reason in the past that we had the regulation of one inch or, or smaller or three inches larger, uh, it's probably been in effect for over 40 years and not many of us in this room, and in fact none of us, have been around long enough to, to, uh, to have been around when that regulation was put in place. I think it was put in place to protect the, the possibility of game fish being caught in there um, and not being able to escape. but. The states of Kentucky uh, and Arkansas and Alabama have a regulation. I think Arkansas has a regulation of one and a half inch or larger. 
Alabama's is one and a quarter larger, and Kentucky's I think is one inch larger. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna recommend to go with this for now. If we if we can determine that there's any detriment to sport fish or any other species of fish over the next couple of years, and we have a catfish research project going on now, then we may come back and address this again. But for now, we'll we'll go forward with this. And, and by the way, hoop nets are uh, entirely, almost entirely used to capture catfish, and they put bait in the back of that uh, net, and it attracts the catfish in there. They used to use these at Real Foot Lake too, uh, to capture crappie when they could legally catch crappie for commercial fishing purposes. But they would use leads and wings, and uh, so we're going to recommend no wings or leads be attached as well. And uh, by this definition, it is no longer would be a trap net. It's strictly a, a hoop net. Taking that out of the definition. And also, uh, by, t by making this change, the nets would be one inch or larger. Uh, so they would be taken out of this restriction too. And, and hoop nets would be allowed to be used to fish year round <coughs> instead of the months of October. Uh, through April. Turtle traps, let's talk a little bit about them, even though we've already mentioned turtles. I want to come back to it only because um, I won't go over this whole thing, but uh, turtle traps are basically uh, set so that a portion of the net has to be above, positioned above the water so that turtles uh, won't drown. They can breathe if they're, ca if they're caught inside the net. Uh, but there's no, uh, there could be some potential for somebody to abuse the regulation by putting leads or wings. So we recommend no wings or leads be attached to turtle traps as well. And uh, fight net, trap net, and pound net. I actually have an example of a trap net. This is actually one that, that we, uh, we use, our biologists use, a reservoir biologist used to, uh, to go out in the fall of the year to capture crappie for uh, analysis of, a, of the population of crappie and see what kind of shape they're in. And we can actually predict year classes by, in most cases, by using trap nets in the fall to capture crappie of all sizes. But they're also used by other fishermen too for other species. So um, again, a long description of it, but we're not, we're not recommending a change in the mesh size of the net itself. However, um, well, this is an illustration for those of you who don't have the privilege of being able to, to uh, handle the miniature version of the trap net, but uh, there is a, a lead that stretches out from the middle of it, and in some cases they have wings on each side. And the only purpose of the leads or the wings is to funnel the fish into the trap net part. It's not to capture fish. And, and so in some cases, the mesh size of, of the leads or the wings can be of the size or even of the material that could capture incidentally uh, there might be some in incidental bycatch of sport fish or non-targeted uh, commercial fish. And so what we're recommending is to uh, only change the, uh, the wings or the lead to a restriction of one inch or smaller on a mesh on a square. And that would take care of the issue there. And, and I think that's all I've got on commercial fishing. Anybody has any questions? Thank you, Bobby. Uh, any questions from the commission on the commercial fishing regulations. Bobby, this is, this is an educational question real quick. There's been a lot of talk about the Asian carp, mm -hmm. and basically that, that, in, that title encompasses what grass, common, silver, and some of the other carp we've got listed. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank it's you. It's got four. There's the black carp, silver carp, big head carp, and grass carp. Those are the four species of Asian carp. Thank you, sir. The common carp, by the way, which is also not native Tennessee is a, you know, it's actually a European carp or German carp is not, con not in that group of Asian carp. Any other qu questions from the commission? Any questions from the audience? Mike, Thank take you. your name and. Uh, Mike Kelly with the Commercial Fishing Advisory Board. Uh, my comments today will mostly be in a form of a thank you uh, first, thank you for changing the meeting and the voting on commercial fishing to this time of year. Most of us that attend the meetings are involved in the paddlefish season, which is November through April. 
So taking care of our issues now is important to us, and we, we thank you for that. I'm kind of going to go down the line as Bobby presented them. The Beach River, my comments on that is I didn't know about the landowner issues either. To just to give you a little history, most of the Beach River back in the back end of it has been used to catch buffalo, not paddlefish. And this is something I think you can expect when you close that. That's going to become a Asian carp haven in the future back in there. So you might want to think about that. Uh, turtles, I don't have any knowledge of turtles. If there's a turtle guy here, he needs to speak to that. Uh, yes, on the inlet, we agree with the changing of the wording and marking the inlet off of that. We ask you to do that. Um, yes, on the hook net change, we ask you to do that. The fight net issue, I, I had no fishermen to call me about the fight nets. Uh, and um, turtle traps, uh, again, I don't know anything about the turtles. So I guess the biggest thing I saw was uh, the back end of Beach River may become a problem area. Uh, most of the fishing back there is for buffalo. I won't get a chance to be here tomorrow. Thank you, and I ask you to vote the hook net in as he's got it stated. and. And the inlet deal, uh, you just need to think about the Beach River. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Commissioner. Yeah, I got a question for Bob. Based on his comments about the Asian carp, how many landowners are involved in that backwater? I could go back to the slide and look. I didn't count them. Uh, Reggie or Tim, do y'all know? 12, 15. Yeah, 12, 15. Well, I mean, would there be, you think we might contact them? ask them if they if they cared if they commercial fished it well and if they object if they don't object we could let them fish it. I don't know that's a that's a legal issue but I, I think we could look into that we haven't had a chance that this just surfaced right. a couple weeks ago we hadn't had a chance to look into any of that yet but we we felt like this was I mean, appropriate we sure don't want to have a have a place where he's in carp or not it's probably best to hold off on that and fight I mean go with the cautiously like we're going right now to until we can find out the personal property rights and stuff like that to what's going well, I'm not on. I'm talking Since about holding it up. I just thought maybe <laughs> that was my comment going as well. On, we, might, yeah. we might try to contact them to see. see yeah. Okay. I think to think you could get a 12, 15 landowners to all agree is <laughs> a waste of time, but see what the procedure would be if one landowner was willing to give permission to whomever or a certain person and what that would entail. Obviously, you're going to get into a lease situation, I imagine, from some of them as well. But, you know, that's something maybe we can look into because, you know, if it was my property, I would probably be open to some form of it's not. I don't have any land there. But Well, due to the gravity of the, of the danger of, uh, no, not danger, but the potential impacts of the Asian carp, that would take a higher prior priority over something that's, Maybe somebody's just going out there making some money off of it, but the actual removal of the Asian carp to benefit all the all the fisheries, uh, we might be able to work something like that. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the commission right now? Question from the audience. State your name and what you're speaking on. I'm Dale Robertson. I'm a commercial fisherman. Uh, this the only thing I'm concerned about was this Beach River thing way all that come about they at one time you could fish everywhere and you had we got a list now of, of harvestable places we can fish at, at one time it was the flip side you could fish everywhere unless it was listed as closed when they flipped that like that it closed a lot of places like beach river duck river bottom i've got a federal permit to fish it and it's not on the list of places to fish you know can i legally fish it or no uh we used to fish camden bottom Rowellen bottom uh, uh, numerous places Crockett Lake and there's a big lake over on the Mississippi River it's a uh, it's private land but when you open lake they want the big heads caught out of there but we can't legally fish it because it's not on our list of places to fish I just you asked Dr. McMillan you said one time you wanted to help us this one time I'd, I'd like to ask you to help us to revert it back like it was if it's not listed as closed, it's deemed open. That way it's, 
that, that all would come about to keep spoon builders out of below Percy Priest Dam is how that happened. See, the, the, like open lake down there, the way the law was, with their permission, we could go in there and fish it. But now we can't. They want us to come in there and catch the big heads, but we can't because it's not on our list of harmful places. Can you address that question? No, I probably can't, only because that's a, more of a law enforcement uh, issue, I think, and less of a fisheries issue. But Yeah, I, I asked law enforcement this past week to give me a, on that, I called up here and they didn't know nothing about it, and I talked to uh, Freddie Couch, and he said he didn't know if it was a rule, a proclamation, or state law. Uh, Why don't he, you give us some time to look into right. that and see what, if any but I, but like I said, I don't want to hold up nothing that's going on because I agree with everything that's going on right now that's proposed. Sounds like we just need to look into seeing what, if there is any possibility of a privately owned lake that had issues with and wanted mm -hmm. someone there to And like I said, the, Duck River Bottom, fish, but as far the, as the dewater in area at Duck River Bottom, you know, it, it As far as saying if we don't mention it as being open, that it's automatically open, that, that's not a it's not really, I don't think, the way that things will operate, but mm -hmm. we can look into see what possibilities there might be. Yeah, but what I'm saying, that, that there was just the tip of the iceberg. You know, maybe we got, we got a lot of other places to look at, so I'm trying to notify you of. You know. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, if I may, I, I think we need to be more specific for him, though. Just looking into it yeah. means. Steve, what is what is looking into it? Let, let's look into it. Give him a, you know, let's don't next year him yeah. show up so want to know if we looked into it. Do we, do Steve, we have this, a this being an enforcement issue, uh, who's who does that fall under? It would be a discussion with our division and Bobby's division to, to look at it. Off the top of my head, I would suggest that we not go to the it's open unless we specifically close it because I think that could entail a whole lot of waters. Yeah. I think what would be more advantageous is to look at some specific waters that may have been open in time in the past that there's some question about now and if they are fishable and whatever and there's no problems there that we specifically open those waters for them rather than reverse. The reverse would be very problematic that would be, I mean, would that? That'd be a great deal. All right, thank yeah. you. Uh, and and there's some waters that are fishable that we've lost. That, that, you know, yeah, that would be great. Just to give you a perfect it, example of what he just said. Come on, come up to the mic. Right? Nobody can hear us except we can hear each other, but they can't. Just to give you a perfect example of this is the Beach River. I mean, we've been fishing nets in the Beach River for 40 years. So, mm -hmm. you know, the commercial fishermen have thought it's been open all their life. But we didn't know that it wasn't TVA right. Hill land until no. just recently. If it's private property, you know, and you can't Definite walk on it in the, needed for all of it. we need to look yeah. into the law as far as anchoring, tying to other people's property. We will direct Bobby and, and the enforcement to look into those and try to get back with you as soon as possible. If you'll get with one of those and uh, give them a list and, and a contact, then we'll contact Mike also with commercial fishing. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Chairman, Chairman Bledsoe, is this something that, you know, I'm trying to follow up where you are. Uh, Steve, Bobby, can we begin to address this so that when we take the regular vote on, when we would typically take the regular vote on this commercial? We're supposed fishing? to vote on, it, on this tomorrow. Yeah, okay. votes tomorrow. <clears throat> That'd probably be. I don't think we can get it done that quick. No, 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 I'm, I'm <laughs> saying, but later, yeah, I think we used to vote in November, I think is what you were saying. They asked us to move it up ahead. No, no, they meant vote. It was in October, but they asked to vote in September. Is there a chance we would have an answer for them in October? Let me just ask it more direct. I don't think so. Probably not. Yeah. We could. Yeah, we're, we're voting commercial. Yeah, we probably need to specify, because he obviously addressed a broad spectrum of topics there. I, that's why I wasn't meaning to sit you down, but um, and if I did, I apologize. But what I was saying is there's so much there that we need to look into before we yeah. speak because you kind of, you went from some water that used to right. be open that's right. now not. That's why I said I didn't want to upset. And also some private land issues and then some trespass on private land issues. There's several issues there. So I we can probably get at least some answers, some kind, you know. I think but. that aspect would take a while longer. That's why I said I don't want to 
don't want to hold up what's before you right now. Yeah. Um, I know that Douglas Lake is privately a, is one of the TVA reservoirs. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have an easement, flowage easement, but they don't own the land. Has, that, has there ever been an issue there or anything raised with regard to that? I'm not familiar with that. Um, Steve, you, you might be, I hate to call on you, but you maybe you're familiar with Douglas Lake more than I am. It's my understanding from working up on Douglas Lake that TVA has an easement <coughs> over it and that the water, this, the land that's under the water is considered TVA while it is, water is over it. As the water goes back, whatever, and land uh, is dry or whatever, then it reverts back to the landowner. I do not think there would be an issue on Douglas Lake. Any other questions from the commission? Any more from the audience? Mike? Uh, you all set me straight in case I'm panicking a little bit. All right, I own a waterfront lot on Kentucky Lake. It's a 150 foot lot with a camper on it. And my deed states that it goes so far out in there and TVA has a right to flood my property. I don't want us to open up a rail car load of dinosaurs today. And we're gonna be going all up and down the Tennessee River and finding out if we can fish in front of everybody that owns a piece of land on Tennessee River. I think I I'm concerned about it too, and maybe we need to look at it from a legal point of view because I know the TVA has taken the position that um, that the land is privately owned and that affixing a dock by mooring it uh, may be a trespass because you're you're actually put your mooring uh, into private soil that's underneath the water. Um, under the terms of their flowage easement, everybody who wants to use the lake itself, the water has a right to do that. But uh, I, I wonder, I wonder about this as well. Are we opening a can of worms? I really, For, and maybe our legal staff needs to, needs to take a look at it. I, I think for today's purposes, I think we feel good about where we are. Uh, and I think it's also been said that there needs to be a little bit more exploration along the lines of your question. That's gonna be done. At some point, and I'm not going to try to put you all near a bus, if you will, I want to let them know when we can do that, okay? And I know asking you this today is putting you on the spot, but let's at least identify a time period that we think it may take. And if it takes longer, it takes longer. But for purposes of today, I believe everybody, there's consensus with the public that this is a good thing to go forward. And so uh, I'm ready for this, uh, as a committee to go forward with. I've got a quick I, I, clarification if I can. Am I up? You're up. What, has the Beach River been open for commercial fishing in the past? I mean, is it open now? The, the river itself or the, the open Any area? Of it, all of it. I, legally, I don't think it has been, but they fished it because it's not identified in our proclamation as being open. But. Mr. Kelly said they've been fishing it. It's not identified as being closed either, mm -hmm. is it? I mean, before we got a list of all the places. Well, that them. begs a question for me. If if we are going to the trouble to close these waters and we're not saying that the all of them are closed, then that would seem to me, if it's not on that closed list, then it's open. And if they've been fishing it for 40 years, then why are we even sticking that dog to say, well, this private property, and we didn't know it, so you can't fish it. So I, I'm just wondering if we're, uh, we're going somewhere that we don't need to go. I think it came about because when we're looking at the Beach River and it, there's a very narrow area where the actual river part is, and we didn't have any, identif uh, any identifiable boundaries as far as how far up the river or if they could even go up the river at all to commercial fish. So we wanted to identify a, a spot where they could fish from this point downstream and no fishing from this point upstream. And then that's why we identified the Highway 69 Bridge. It was an identifiable place 
No fishing above that, fishing below it. And then we ran into these other things about the land. We didn't know that. And we just kind of, it wasn't something we intended to do, but it was just something that came about as a result of us looking into it. We had originally thought we could open all that water up after, uh, at the, uh, even as of the last commission meeting, we thought we could open up all that open water area. It wouldn't be a big deal, except for where it narrows down. And then when, uh, when Region 1 discovered the, the landowner issue, we had to, felt like we had to do it that. Like it's been open all the time anyway. It was. Well, not well, open, but it was not. Close, it? I don't know if it was. It never was described. Are, are we making? Are we being asked to make a decision for biological reasons, or are we being asked to make a decision because of some issue regarding ownership of land? And it sounds to me it's the, it's the latter. Well, originally it was a biological issue, and then now it has become the ownership of the land more than anything well, else. Well, I I think that that uh, we should be concerned about that because I think we could potentially run into this in other areas in this state and uh, uh, I'm uncomfortable with it until it's looked at from a legal point of view and whether that's something we want to get in the business of doing closing waters because there may be an ownership underneath this same issue has come up with waterfowl I assume with anchoring boats anchoring decoys underwater I mean, it would be it in would general? be the same issue, would it not? I looked at a farm once and read deeds and everything, and it included to the original channel of the river. So, the group that I was showing the farm to, they were buying it with the impression that no one could anchor, or tie up, or have decoys on their property because they own that land. But when the water was high, it covered some portion of it. But as it went down, so that they were free to. I don't know the law, but I mean, with a vessel, you can float across it, but you can't anchor to that property. So I'm, I'm sure it's come up with duck hunting because of decoys, and I don't know if anybody's, from a law enforcement perspective, how is that enforced, or is it something that the landowner's got to try to come forward to process? You know, how does that work? I mean, is it a non-issue, or? Yeah, it sounds like we need a legal opinion to make. I mean, this may be out of our control. I mean, we're, you know, it may make common sense or something, but I don't know if it's even within our control. If I could, Mr. Chairman, just, I, I don't even play a lawyer on TV, so I'm not going to issue an opinion. I'll just go back a, a little bit to tell you that, and Cheryl can nod her head, navigation issues and landowner rights where water is concerned is one of the most difficult and most vague parts of Tennessee law that I'm concerned with or that I used to be concerned with quite a bit. There's, there was a recent Supreme Court decision that dealt with flooded lands in the western part of the state, primarily actually was in another state, it was either Missouri or Arkansas, where flooded lands were there and there was a question, could the landowner prohibit people from fishing because it was flooded and people wanted to come into what land was flooded for a short period of time, wanted to commercial fish and recreational fish. There was a Supreme Court decision about that, that one issue. In Tennessee, Navigation gets down to, in most places, if it's not declared navigable by a court, then it's not navigable. And there's another decision about two landowners splitting a, a piece of land, and if, if, if they jointly agree that you can't fish in that section of water, then you can float it if it's considered navigable, but that's first it's got to be happening. Then they could keep you from fishing in that area, depending on how the deeds were written. And so it, I, I just say all that to you, it gets so convoluted, it's extremely difficult. And the, the times where we've been really involved with it, there, it goes to the Corps engineers, it goes to the Tennessee Valley Authority, it goes to Tennessee Environment and Conservation, and then the, it, there, there's just so much that has to be considered, so it's very difficult to try to, to to render an overall opinion. When you get into the big reservoirs where you've got little creeks and things, it's pretty well defined, and you can say, well, that's that's the area we're talking about. Well, even when it, if it's rule navigable, then the whole the whole reservoir becomes navigable under depending on whether it's Corps engineers or whether it's under the Coast Guard. So, again, not to be too redundant, it's just it's all over the board. And 
I, I would like to be able to, and to Commissioner Kennedy, I'd like to be able to give these folks some kind of time frame that we could come back and say, yeah, here's what we're going to do, or we just don't have the ability to render your opinion right now. And I, I, I would push for, is that possible to December, Bobby, to at least have that headed down that road to say, we could try. We, well, that, and that's what I'm getting with. by the December meeting. We'll have tried to do enough background to tell you on that particular issue. The overall one that we're talking about statewide, that's almost a case by case basis. And I, I don't mean to be vague, but the law is vague. Director Carter, the reason we're proposing this language right now is because it's, it's a safe, legal, position to be in yes sir and at the same time we're making a commitment to dive deeper into the legal waters to, to check this out and we can amend this proclamation and so I, I guess this is not being cast in stone forever and ever frankly it's protecting you and us and it gives us some time to do some checking and just by y'all nodding your heads I'm assuming us going forward in this matter I don't think three months is going to kill us at this particular location is it are we okay we're understanding you right you're just you're, just, you're going to vote on everything you're just going to kind of hold up on the beach river part or look into that probably going to add the beach river in there the way the proclamation is wrote up we're erring on the side of caution and just putting in the three miles that is covered by the TBA. And right <clears throat> right and then Come here. Okay, yeah, that's all we're doing. We're, we're drawing the line at that three mile mark until we can take the next three months and get a little bit better information further upstream. That's it. Is that, it feels reasonable, but I want to make sure we're not missing anything. I don't fish in that area, but a lot of his folks do. It sounds very reasonable to me. You okay? All right, thank you. I, I think you got to be careful on what the results we get for that because. It has potential, I mean, if, if you have a navigable waterway and people on the river zone to the middle of the river like they think they do, and all of a sudden we determine you can't fish it and you can't anchor there, then you're shutting down a lot of fishing, you know what I'm saying? So it could have long extending ramifications for a lot of, a lot of fishing in Tennessee. So I think we have to tread lightly as we go forward with it. Well, and, and I'm not sure we, you know, are we gonna, during the next three months, are we gonna have people petitioning that we close their cove to any bottom fishing in, on Douglas Lake. And, and I just, I think we're, I think we need to check it out before we enact that particular part of this proclamation. That would, that would be my choice. I'm, I'm going to agree with that. I think that riparian rights, and we're going to start making judgments on whether we allow any kind of fishing based on that particular thing, it's, and I hadn't thought about it till 10 minutes ago, but that sounds like we're setting a precedent that could be real hard to get out of, that was unintended. Has there been a landowner complaint? Let me, let me offer, this, and this is something, I'm not an attorney, but these deeds are what I deal in semi-regularly, and every one of them are different, unfortunately. When TVA acquired the right to flood property, you'll get three or four different versions on the same reservoir. That's the facts of life. I think what we're going to deal with first is Beach River. I think there's a yellow flag flying long term. We need to be looking at these other things. And it's not a matter of us making, you know, a decision, if you will, that's going to supersede anything else. We got to do some research. That's why I don't have a problem. This has come to our attention. I don't have a problem taking a conservative position until we have a little bit more information. And for three months, I'm hearing you all are fine with it. And uh, we may find out something overall that we're gonna have to revisit. But let's, let's take this in bites, and that would be my recommendation. All right. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we adopt Proclamation 1312 with the exception of the portion dealing with the Beach River. Are you going to delete it or amend it to not include the private property? Am I 
you're just going to delete it all together. I, I think that's what we do it, at this point. Basically, if we do that, we are saying no fishing in the Beach River. Period. No commercial. Guys, uh, I may be wrong, but as it stands now, there is no fishing allowed in the Beach River, right? Nothing. That we're talking about. So we're not, I don't know that we're setting any precedent at this point. We're just opening up a portion of it because we can see that they're probably, well, that portion shouldn't have these conflicts. So, you know, if we were setting a precedent to me would be if we were closing something that was all open. But as of now, it's not open at all. We're just opening a portion up. But I may be wrong. I, you're, my problem you is deal the with reason it. that we're giving for doing what we're doing. And, and I think that reason is setting a precedent and I think it's raising a, a potential problem because I've seen I've, I mean I've actually seen litigation involving uh, docks and, 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 and uh, <coughs> such as that on, on Douglas Lake because it's privately owned there's a flow easement you can use that water but when you try to anchor a dock you're liable to have somebody who's got a deed to that dirt under the water coming and giving you a hard time. And I just don't, I just don't see that we need to, to base our decisions on that without having a legal opinion on it. I've got a document right here. It has a legal opinion on it. On it's about the public ownership of rivers in the United States. I just happen to have it in my stuff. But it was from 1980 from Attorney General Nashville. If you read that, did you give that to me? It says right here, if the waterway is not navigable, repairing owners have a, have a absolute rights of property in and to the stream and its bed. If it's wa if waterway is navigable, in the ordinary or common sense, the ownership of the water bed belongs to the repairing owners, but the public has an easement in the waterway for the purpose of navigation, which can be adapted. So, I mean, that's just, I don't know. I don't know if we can go from there if we need to look at it further, but I mean, is there other legislation that's been passed since then? or is So I don't know how you determine then what's navigable and what's not. So at what point is the stream not navigable anymore? Is that what y'all tried to determine through TVA's ownership or what? No, no, this, I think Director Carter said that all the water, if, if Kentucky Lake Reservoir is declared navigable, then I would think, I remember you saying that all the water that they can float on is navigable, even up in the creeks. The, the difference being that the navigation issue is a separate issue than bottom and you you may be able to navigate over that area but you may not necessarily be able to stop anchor or attach anything to that bottom if it's privately owned I don't know we'll probably I'll just leave it all alone but is that our is that our place to try to govern that that sounds like a civil issue to me if somebody goes in there, we go, we're going to close it to duck hunting because somebody might put a duck blind in there. Can, can we ask Cheryl to come up and maybe answer some questions for us? I feel like I'm in a Tchaikovsky, you know, Tchaikovsky, if you don't know music, he has about five different endings to his compositions. <laughs> and I felt like we've had a really good stopping place about five times. I'd love to sum this all up and, and, and have a grand finale. I'll try to do my best. Basically, water law, navigation law is incredibly complicated. I've been answering, trying to answer, and putting off answers to questions for 25 years on the subject because it is so complicated. Everything depends on deeds. Everything depends on ancient law that, that, that somehow they try to change over the years. It's very, very complicated. And the books that are written on the subject can fill this room. But that's not what we're really here about today. I found out Friday when they were um, researching to, to decide whether or not to open up the Beach River area to co commercial fishing, they got a hold of a map. And it showed all the landowner interest under the water. And they came to me and said, what the heck is this? I've never seen anything like it. And I said, I haven't either. Not since Wilfoot Lake, when Tito Bray went and built bought all the property under the water so that we, there would be no legal issues. So this may be happening all over the state. I don't know. I hope not. But I think this is an isolated incident. It may be that the map's wrong. We haven't talked to these people. So all we know right now is it is safe 
to open up Beach River to a certain point, and we're willing to do that. But as for the rest of it, we would like more time to look at the legal issues and make sure. And I think it is up to us. If we don't have a legal right to tell people they can fish over water, I don't think we should. So that's all we're saying is let's open up what, what we can this month and look at it a little more and hopefully open up the rest of it in the future. That's all. proclamation does I just don't want to I, I don't want to be a part of going on the record and saying that TWRA has determined that there's private land under this body of water and therefore we're closing this to fishing I just don't think we want to go there and but if we're if if, if the intent of this and, and what it achieves is just to open a portion where there's no dispute then I don't have any I don't have any problem with that but I think we do need to understand uh, our legal rights and responsibilities with regard to the land underlying the waters of the state. Commissioner, that's, that's the only reason I'm supporting this, is, it, is what she said. We feel good about our position up to that point, and we need more time above that. And uh, with your, it, well, are you I, I will withdraw my motion um, to the extent that what we're doing is simply opening up an area of the Beach River. Commissioner Bledsoe, with that, I make a motion that we approve Proclamation 13-12 as presented today. Motion has been made. Do I hear a second? Motion and second. Uh, this is a committee vote, so all in favor say aye. Aye. So moved. Anybody opposed? <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Bobby. Okay. All right. The, the commercial, I'm commercial. The Fishers <laughs> Management Committee would like to uh, recognize Wesley Roberts to uh, discuss a catfish issue. My name is uh, Wesley Roberts. When you get a little older, you have to kind of write your speech down, but. I don't want y'all to worry, most of this is just empty paper. <laughs> I had a friend here in Hatchy Bottom. He's got a, about 100 acres of high wire fenced in, and he wanted me to ask you if, if you would pass a rule that would allow the hunting guys to trap some 8 and 10 pound bucks up here and land between the lakes so they could put them in there and, you know, have hunters come in and so they could get some pretty good prices for them, you know, high value thing. And he just wanted me to ask you, how many of y'all would consider that? Is there, could I see a hand here? No? But see, this is exactly what the commercial fishermen are asking you to do with catfish by changing the rule that will allow them to catch unlimited numbers of the big trophy catfish. Under the guise that they say there's a fillet market for them, it must be hiding because I can't find it, not at least in West Tennessee. There is no, there is no market. I've asked you, why is an eight or 10 point book of any more of a trophy to a hunter than a 40 or 50 pound catfish is to a fisherman? Other than the deer, he probably looks a little bit wetter, better up on the wall than a catfish would. But you know, the more I thought about writing this, you know, I, it kind of got the matter I got. Who am I mad at? I'm not mad at Mike Kelly. Heck, Mike was a businessman. Those commercial fishermen, they put money in his pocket, and so he's for them. I'm not even mad at the commercial fishermen. The commercial fishermen, most of them, they were raised to believe that the catfish was put there for the privilege of them to take just whatever they wanted. That's the way they were raised. I'm not mad at them. I'm mad at you. No. But the last time I was here, I asked you to copy Alabama's catfish that no catfish over 34 inches could be transported across state lines alive. Hey, but you know, you sat on your hands. But then I'm, you know, then I'm going to kind of feel sorry for you. 
I just happened to think that what if you really actually did pass this law? You know, down the road in two or three years, <laughs> you could thump yourself on the chest and brag to your friends how you helped pass the rule that allowed co commercial fishermen to strip the rivers of these trophy catfish and strip them they can and would. But hey, you know these Yankees up north? They'll thank you for keeping their pay lakes full of these trophy catfish. Not only that, but those fish will go north and you would deprive the thousands of Tennesseans the opportunity to catch these catfish because they're gone. The Alabama was such a no-brainer to me, I thought I had kind of explained to you, and I assumed that the facts I gave you, you, you know, you, you would pass such a rule. But hey, but then it came to me, you know, maybe I confused you, I don't know, maybe it's my fault, I'm mad at me. But you know, then I happened to think, common sense, because out of the mouths of the commercial fishermen, they themselves came the answer. On several occasions, they have admitted they were only fishing three to four days a week. They can't sell anymore. Then why aren't they fishing the other days with three inch nets because they can catch all the seven to 14 pound fish they need to fillet. The other one or two days that they have to fish because the fish market for fillets they claim it just doesn't exist. The only market for these big fish is pay lakes, period. In 2008, the 34-inch rule was changed to allow the commercial fishermen to take one catfish over 34 inches. I came to the meeting that day when they passed it. When I came in, I was told the rule was changing. No public notice, no discussion, passed, period. I later found out that it was recommended by the legislature merely to shut up Representative Willie Borchert, who was constantly badgering the legislature to repeal the 34-inch rule. Willie was a commercial fisherman, his son was a commercial fisherman, but hey, Willie's no longer in the legislature. He's like me, he's got too old to fish. His son Tim was a commercial fisherman, but he's quit. In fact, he's fishing next week at Cabela's Sportsman's Tournament. I was gonna ask you, oh, I wanna read a, a little thing. This argument about this has been going on for years. This is a couple of paragraphs from Hunting and Fishing News, dated April 2007. Better put my glasses on. This is an article about trophy catfishing and they'd had a meeting, a subcommittee meeting in uh, Nashville and they were changed the rule but it was tied three to three and so it didn't do anything. So, but anyway, this is what it was talking about trophy catfishing. When we this first came about the notion to protect trophy catfish and cats in Tennessee initially, commercial anglers said they did not want the bigger catfish, saying there is no market for them. Fish markets don't buy the bigger fish, they said. And most trophy cat fishermen practice catch and release. So well, what is there to argue about? Well, inner representative Willie Borchard came to Tennessee who said that law did indeed hurt cat fishermen in his district. Another thing, just a thought, but why doesn't Tennessee create a law that makes it illegal to transport live trophy catfish across state lines? If you fillet a fish, he's dead. So why is there an argument over taking a live catfish across the state line? If they want them for fillets, they kill them. Why do they object? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. We appreciate you coming and letting us know on that uh, again. And we we really do uh, share your sympathy in some instances. Uh, I'd like to recognize 
Director Carter right now talk about the dedication of two boat ramp accesses, access areas in Giles County. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's kind of a segue between Fisheries Committee and into the Boating Law Enforcement Committee. But just want to make a couple of comments about yesterday. But before I do that, let me move back just a second. Last week was our Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies meetings and quite a bit of talk about CITES issues and so forth. One of the things that came out in this last ruling, apparently three different species of turtles now are listed under the CITES Act and that probably won't have much effect on Tennessee fishermen unless they try to export. Uh, it's, it's all the map turtles and to be honest, I can't remember the other species that were there, but just found out about that, so I'll follow up with you on that a little bit later. But anyway, back to what yesterday was about. Uh, our engineering crew, uh, and Ronnie Bowder in particular, in this instance, and his two groups, or his group that worked on the, usually just my gut and the pictures, but anyway. <coughs> now I can't even get that one off. Anyway, yesterday we had a, two different access areas that we've tried to put together for quite a number of years. Uh, it finally came about, we got all the permitting and everything else done, and and Dwight Hensley, who's chief of our engineering division, can give you a little bit more information as he talks about some other information that, regarding other access areas in a second. You know, over the state, we have about 300 of those areas, and every year we try to add a few more, and then, of course, there's maintenance to all those, and things go up and up, but they're really good sites, and if you ever see our guys work, they, they absolutely are amazing. They can go into an area that just just nothing but rubble and brush and pretty soon you either have a nice road on a management area or you have a great access area so down there in Giles County there's a place called Richland Creek and there's another one called Chicken Creek and between those two we put in two different ramps it makes about a six to six and a half mile float and it, it's been used by people for years but they couldn't get in and out of those creeks very well great fishing area so that now is open between those two. We had a dedication there yesterday. We had several local officials show up, the county executive, the former representative there, the representative that's there now, uh, Jim Potts, who's the retired uh, law enforcement supervisor from that area. Had, anyway, we had probably 25 or 30 people show up at the dedication. It was really a good day. I just wanted to let you know that how well that went off and, and the, the genuine appreciation from the people in that area for the things that that they thought saw the agency doing and that what they thought because Giles County doesn't have a lot of water other than you know in terms of major reservoirs these creeks that they have between the area now next to the Elk River and then the Richland Creek and Chicken Creek are very important to them so don't dwell on that too much just wanted you to know that that all that went on and Commissioner Schuster was there as well and just wanted to pass it on it was it was a good day and we wish you could have been there but we have pictures later on to show you. I just wanted to reiterate what Director Carter said. It was just a great event to be at. And, you know, you get so busy in things that are around you or areas that's around you, and you go down to some of these smaller areas, and you see what an impact that those boat ramps, ramps had for that community. It was amazing. They were just so excited and so thrilled. And, you know, I, th I thought about that a lot more and, and realized that, you know, you can have all the resources in the world, but if you don't have access, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. And they we're dragging canoes up and down banks and and so this meant a lot to them and of course Dwight and your team is they do a phenomenal job there's uh, you know they could just put something in but aesthetically they do it right and, and everybody notices that and that speaks volumes for our agency and um, also three officers down there uh, wasn't their job to do any of that but they needed some help and those guys just pitched in mm -hmm. and um, that's just a credit to our agency and how everybody pulls together to to pull a great event like that off. So I just wanted to tell you thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Director Carter, and thanks to all the engineering crew for all they do. And I'm sure the Chicken Creek one was awesome. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm a chicken farmer. I'm kind of biased. <laughs> We've got a pause here. I'm going to turn it over to Chairman McMillan. And uh, they're ready for a pause. 